You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and as usual, Words on Film, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film, are solely those of your host and movie critic Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of anyone, any employee of the station on which this show is broadcast, or the station as a whole. And as you can see, it's not just me, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, but also I brought with me a minor cold. So I have to talk all the way through this show. It's going to be not exactly painful, but you might not like my voice all the time, but I'm going to try to do my best here. Hey, it is a minor cold in, in that I'm just getting stuffy from time to time, but I'm doing my best and I'm being a trooper and here to review movies for you. So before I get into the four movies that I'm going to be reviewing for this show, let me get into my usual segment, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. So the number one film this week does not surprise me exactly, but it does greatly disappoint me, which probably is a little bit of a spoiler alert for how I felt about this movie. The number one movie at the box office this past weekend was Tyler Perry's Boo 2, A Medea Halloween, a sequel that I don't think anybody actually wanted, including Tyler Perry and Medea fans, but they got anyway. So anyway... This movie grossed $21.2 million at the U.S. box office this weekend against a budget of $25 million. Now, in comparison, the original Boo and Medea Halloween, which opened last year on October 21st, 2016, grossed in its first weekend $27.6 million. So, even though it's still debuting at number one, and that's relatively impressive, it's, it grossed a lot less than its predecessor. And I don't have any information on the international numbers. I would love to know what an international audience thinks about the Medea movies, but moving on. The number two highest grossing debut film of the week is also the number two film of the week. It is Geostorm, which is not one of the four movies I'm going to review for you for the show, unfortunately, but I'll try to catch that probably next week. So Geostorm grossed $13.7 million this past weekend against a very hefty budget of 120 million so even though geostorm opened strongly in terms of its place at the box office it's going to take a lot to regain all that money it's not looking particularly good for geostorm however internationally it has grossed 65.8 million dollars but is still not hit yet here in the states or around the world Happy Death Day is number was number one last week. This week it fell to number three, having grossed $9.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. But against a budget of $4.8 million, Happy Death Day has grossed $40.7 million here in the States and $53.7 million around the world, which makes it undeniably a certified hit here in the States and globally. Blade Runner 2049 is a movie that's getting great reviews. Everyone I've spoken to, including myself, has, has raved about this movie, but it's not pulling in impressive numbers at the box office. This week, it's number four at the box office, sliding from number two last week in its third week in release. Blade Runner 2049 made... This past weekend, $7.4 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget of $150 million, Blade Runner 2049 has so far made $74.2 million here in the States and $194.1 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States, but globally it is a tentative hit. However, it still has a long way to go to recoup its budget. And even though its place at the box office right now looks promising, its numbers really don't. So we may be looking at a flop here, but definitely a flop that's not deserved. Only the Brave is the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number five at the box office, having grossed six million dollars even against a budget of thirty-eight million dollars. And that six million is in U.S. box office receipts alone. I do not have the international numbers for this movie, but Only the Brave is off to a good start critically, just commercially, it has a ways to go. 
The Foreigner is number six at the box office this weekend, sliding from number seven last week. The Foreigner, starring Jackie Chan, earned $5.8 million this weekend. Against a budget of $35 million, though, The Foreigner has earned $23.2 million here at the U.S. box office, and around the world it has grossed $111.6 million, meaning that it's not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is a certified hit, thanks largely in part due to Jackie Chan's international appeal. The, excuse me, the movie It slid from number four last week to number seven this week, having made $3.5 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $35 million, though, it has so far made $320.2 million here in the States and $653 million worldwide, which means it's a certified hit here in the States and around the world. The Snowman debuted at number seven at the box office this week with pretty weak numbers. It only made $3.4 million at the U.S. box office against a budget of $35 million. And internationally, it has grossed $22.6 million, which still doesn't make it a hit overseas, but here in the U.S., it looks like a bomb, and I would not be surprised to not see this movie in the top 10 next week. American Maid, starring Tom Cruise, is number nine at the box office this weekend, sliding from number six last week, having earned $3.1 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $50 million, that's five zero million million, American Maid has so far made $45.5 million here in the States and $121.3 million worldwide, meaning that it's very close to becoming a tentative hit here in the States, but it's not a hit yet. Around the world, though, it is a certified hit. And finally, number 10 at the box office this weekend is Kingsman, The Golden Circle, which earned $3 million this weekend and slid from number 7 last week to number 10 this week. And against a budget of $104 million, Kingsman the Golden Circle has made so far in the United States $94.6 million, which it doesn't, which means it's not a hit yet, and it may never be, but around the world it has made $344.3 million, which makes it a certified hit worldwide. Meanwhile, movies that were in the top 10 last week, such as The Mountain Between Us, The Lego Ninjago Movie, My Little Pony the Movie, and Victoria and Abdul are nowhere to be found in the top 10. Listen, my life changed because someone was there to get me to use drugs. No one can understand. People think that having someone who will listen makes it better. I need help. I'm listening. I need help. I think that having someone who will listen makes it better. People understand. No one can get me to use drugs. My life changed because someone was there to listen. Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to turn addiction around. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Greetings, Earthlings. This is Funkatron 5000, the intergalactic space robot. Whenever I cross through the Milky Way I make sure to tune into Crushed Velvet Soul on bostonfreeradio.com. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Monday. It's the place I go to get on down and get funky. I think you will too. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access Television, or a community radio station or community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Tyler Perry's Boo 2, A Medea Halloween. That is the official name of the movie. So I have a bunch of problems with this. First of all, if you put Medea in a movie, it's Tyler Perry. So I don't know why Tyler Perry keeps inserting his name into the titles. Secondly, I might be a little pedantic here, but the movie is called Boo 2, A Medea Halloween. It should be another Medea Halloween, don't you think? Well, title grievances aside, my real grievance with this movie is that it sucks. 
I, I'm not even kidding here. This is a movie, that, this is a sequel to a movie that no one a asked for a sequel to. I don't even think that diehard Tyler Perry slash Medea fans wanted the sequel. And unfortunately, my grievances with the original Boo and Medea Halloween are multiplied 20-fold in this movie. At least Boo, which... You might remember I declared one of the worst movies of 2016, and I do not back down from saying that. At least that had a plot. This one doesn't. The, the plot that's given to me on the website is that Brian Simmons' daughter, Tiffany, and Brian Simmons is the other uh, Tyler Perry character, the one where he doesn't dress in either drag or heavy makeup. But anyway, his daughter, Tiffany, is 18 and wants to go to a frat party at Camp Derrick, a haunted campground. So the old people in this movie, Medea, Bam, Hattie, and Joe, two of whom are also played by Tyler Perry, venture out after her and the group must run for their lives when monsters, goblins, and the boogeyman are unleashed. Now, notice I read monsters, goblins, and the boogeyman. Th those are not in this movie at all. There are no monsters, there are no goblins, and I don't even know what the boogeyman is, but he's not here. Instead, you get a bunch of horror movie cliches that are thrown together here, but what's even worse than the horror movie cliches, which you might expect from a movie as farcical as a Medea movie, but what's even worse is that you see these four elderly people, and they're elderly in the film, but in reality, they're actually played by actors in their 40s and 50s, including Tyler Perry. But mainly, about 60% of the movie is them sitting around and bickering, and doing so in extremely annoying voices. In fact, there's one old person who's played by an actress named Patrice Lovely, who is only in her 40s, yet she's playing a woman in her 70s. The, the, the character of hers is Hattie Mae Love, who has a voice that is so annoying that she makes Wanda Sykes sound like Tony Braxton. That, I, I, and that's not even describing how annoying her voice is. Basically, she cannot enunciate words, but I guess it's kind of the point of her character. But every time I heard her voice in this movie, I just wanted to scream. In addition to that, the movie is taking this moral ground, yet despite that, it is... It's a movie that is extremely vulgar, particularly when it comes to Tyler Perry's characters of Medea and Joe. And I, I get sort of the appeal of the Medea character, even though I don't like Medea. But this Joe character, my God, I don't think he's funny at all. Plus, the, the makeup on Tyler Perry's face is so weak that the character Joe looks like he's decaying right in front of us. I, I don't know what else to say about this film. It's just basically this movie that takes these moral family values and puts them together in a movie that was undeservedly rated PG-13. There are R-rated swear words in this movie, and there's also some sexual content that I think would be too explicit for children under the age of 13, and I don't know how this movie, of all movies, got the PG-13 rating. But again, like me being pedantic with the title of this movie, that's not the reason that Boo 2 sucks. It, is, it sucks because Tyler Perry in these Medea movies is getting to the point where he does not even try. Now, don't get me wrong, I do not have a problem with Tyler Perry. I don't hate Tyler Perry. I don't try to hate any celebrities, but I can tell when somebody is checked out of a movie and when they are completely invested in it. And Tyler Perry is not invested in his Medea films. He's he seems to be doing this, even though he owns the character, out of contractual obligation and in order to make a buck. He doesn't need to make any more money with the Medea character. Pretty much, you either love Medea or you hate her, but I can assure you that even people who like the Medea character do not want to see her on screen anymore. Unfortunately, lo and behold, I checked IMDb and I found out that Tyler Perry is actually making another Medea movie called, and I'm not making this up, A Medea Family Funeral. Now, I hope that when he makes this film, he kills off Medea and or Joe for good. 
But the other thing about Boo 2 is that the scares aren't there. And you, you would think in a horror movie parody there would be some sort of scares. I mean, that, that's, that seems to be a given. But when these so-called boogeymen, in other words, people with masks and chainsaws and other seemingly paranormal creatures come about and they scare the old people in this movie, particularly Medea and Joe. I'm not scared for them because I want them to die. I am so sick and tired of seeing these movies at, on the big screen. And yes, I do. I did have expectations going in that this movie would suck, but I thought it would be at least a little entertaining. And I regret that I have 30 seconds left to talk about this movie, and I have to wrap it up because I hated this movie so goddamn much. Boo 2, A Medea Halloween is an absolute flunk out. It sucks so Sucks, 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 sucks. God damn it, Tyler Perry. You could do so much better than this. I hate that you did a sequel to this stupid movie from last year. You could do so much better. You are a good actor, but you are not funny as Medea. Hang the wig up and move on. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Yeah. Listen to She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on BostonFreeRadio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and for those tuning in right before the break I think you saw me tear apart the movie Boo to a Medea Halloween directed by starring producing produced and written by Tyler Perry I had to take a breather based on how much vitriol I had for that film but it only goes to show you that that will probably be in my list of worst movies of 2017 at the end of the year. I can never really tell what's going to be the best at this point in the year, but I can wholeheartedly assure you that Boo 2 and Medea Halloween will be in the worst. With that said, let me go into a movie I actually kind of liked. This movie is Only the Brave, which is the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for this show after I breathe a little bit. So Only the Brave is a biographical action drama film, and let me actually bring it up on my big screen. So Only the Brave is a true story, and it's a true story about the Granite Mountain hotshots who were an elite crew of firefighters who, a little bit of a spoiler alert here, but not really, perished while battling the Yarnell Hill Fire in Arizona in June of 2013. And the film naturally is dedicated to their memory. So the Yarnell Hill Fire was a wildfire, excuse me, wildfire near Yarnell, Arizona, which was ignited by lightning, interestingly enough, on June 28, 2013. And on June 30th, it overran and killed 19 City of Prescott firefighters, all of whom were members of the Granite Mountain Hotshots. And this movie starts from the very beginning. It doesn't really give you a narrative framework telling you that these firefighters are about to die. So actually, I went into this movie not knowing that it was based on a true story, and the ending did actually floor me. But I'm not exactly spoiling that for you because it says in the description of the movie on IMDb that these firefighters did perish, or a great majority of them did. So what, what was really great about this movie, though, was the, the acting, particularly from Josh Brolin. I think this is probably Josh Brolin's best acting role since No Country for Old Men. And Josh Brolin's been nominated for an Oscar once. It wasn't ironically for No Country for Old Men. It was actually for his role in Milk, which was a good role. But I think that 
this movie made me believe that Josh Brolin was not a a career actor. It made me feel like he was a career firefighter. And I got to commend Josh Brolin for being as dedicated to this role as he was. There are a lot of great actors in this movie. Jeff Bridges is also in this movie as a veteran forest firefighter named Dwayne Steinbrink, who certainly has some role, some areas of gravitas dramatic gravitas in this role as well as some good comedic parts as well as you might expect from Jeff Bridges he certainly played that kind of old curmudgeon in a number of films of recent years and it seems to be serving him very well and the movie focuses primarily on the relationship between Josh Brolin's character, Eric Marsh, who's not a composite character. This is actually a person who was the real-life leader of the Granite Mountain Hot Shots, and also a new recruit named Brendan McDonough, who's played in this movie by Miles Teller. And when we're introduced to Brendan McDonough, he is a slacker and a stoner. He lives at home with his parents. He basically stays in his room getting high and watching The Price is Right. And it's only when he gets in trouble with the law from a botched attempt to steal a GPS from somebody's dashboard that he goes to jail gets released, and ultimately his mother kicks him out. In addition to that, he also has an on-again, off-again girlfriend in this movie who he accidentally impregnates. So not only being temporarily homeless, but also risking having a child without a father, Brendan reluctantly joins the Grand Mountain Hotshots and begins to train to be a forest firefighter. And not only are the acting performances particularly impressive in this film, especially Josh Brolin and Jeff Bridges, but you also get a really good sense of respect for the firefighting that these, these hot shots were actually do and have done and the way they risk their lives and also the fact that forest fighting is not just going over a, a flaming forest on an airplane and dumping water that's not what the what these kind of firefighters do especially not the grand amount hot shots and they also don't they also work long hours and not just when there's a fire in the forest and very much like American Sniper that came out a few years ago to mixed reviews when I saw American Sniper I had an appreciation for the members of the armed services especially the snipers who fight on ground zero in Iraq and Afghanistan and when I saw that movie I felt m almost more patriotic because of it. Similarly, when I see a movie like Only the Brave, I certainly gained an even greater appreciation for these firefighters who fight forest fires. And also, contrary to what Smokey the Bear says, these, these kinds of rampant forest fires are not actually human made. It's not kids out in the woods smoking cigarettes. And the movie doesn't exactly get into the cause of some of these fires, but you pretty much get the idea. It also doesn't get into the politics of global warming and perhaps the idea that global warming is not the cause of some of these firefighter, uh, the forest fires, but it certainly doesn't help the fact and is making forest fires even worse. Those are all valid concerns, but Only the Brave focuses primarily on the job that these forest firefighters actually do and how it's not quite as straightforward a job in terms of description as you might expect. It's also a lot harder than you might expect. I thought not only was the acting really good and you certainly gained an appreciation for what they do, but there are also some beautiful panoramic shots and when the CGI forest fires actually happened, the fires looked authentic. It's for that reason that only The Brave gets my rating of a knockout. I'm not sure if it's the best movie of the year or one of the best movies, but it's certainly one of Josh Brolin's best performances if I were to single out anyone. In 50 feet, turn left. 
you driving so slowly? After a few drinks, I'm taking it slow. Well, you're not fooling the cop behind you. What? Get ready to pay in point one miles. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Every Monday night, tune into the Misery of Cities from 8 to 9 for 40 years of lost psychedelic, kraut rock, new wave, post-punk, indie, shoegaze. Found again and heard only on Boston Free Radio. Making Waves with Boston's all-Italian language program featuring Italian pop, rock, and folk music from yesterday and today. Amici ascoltatori, vi aspettiamo ogni sabato dalle 11 a mezzogiorno qui su bostonfreeradio.com con musica italiana di ieri e oggi. Buon ascolto. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Snowman. Now, you would think a movie called The Snowman, which comes out in October, is either a kid's movie with a Christmas theme, or it is a horror film with an ironic... <laughs> killer character. It's neither of those things. It is a little bit more horror, but it's actually classified as crime drama horror. In fact, the fact that they put horror in the description of this on IMDb is a little misleading, but it's more of a murder mystery thriller. And it's about a detective who lives in Oslo, Norway, named Harry Hull, who's played by Michael Fassbender, who investigates the disappearance of a woman whose pink scarf is found wrapped around an ominous-looking snowman. So this is a movie about a detective who is hunting for a serial killer, and this movie has a lot of great actors in it. It has Michael Fassbender, Charlotte Gainsborough, or Charlotte Gainsbourg, I'm not sure how her last name is pronounced, J.K. Simmons, Toby Jones, Val Kilmer, and unfortunately, th this movie is a prime example of how a movie with a very interesting premise can be brought down almost instantly with bad editing. And that is the case of The Snowman. The movie is detailing this detective in Oslo, Norway, who's searching for a serial killer, and this serial killer, every time he kills someone, he leaves behind either an actual snowman or traces of a snowman. And when I describe that to you, you must think, my God, that is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Well, in the movie, it takes, the atmosphere of the film, to its credit, takes that sort of serial killer leaving their mark a little bit more seriously, but yeah, in premise, it's stupid. But that's not the only thing that drives this movie to not be as good as it can be. To the credit of a lot of the actors here, Michael Fassbender, Charlotte Gainsbourg, and all the rest, they try their best with what they're given. Unfortunately, the movie leaves you with a sense of confusion because if the movie had just stuck to... Michael Fassbender's character's hunt for the serial killer and almost showing more patterns of the serial killer killing people besides certain traits of their personal lives and leaving behind a snowman, I think it would be a little bit more credible. It is based on a book which was written by Soren, S uh, Norwegian name, Svistrup. I'm, I'm going to just pronounce that as best I can. I'm sorry. That that was one of the people who wrote the screenplay. The novel was, was written by Joe Nespo, who is also Norwegian. So the the screenplay was written by three people. Let me let me say that in a less passive sentence. Three people wrote the screenplay. Peter Strauen, Hossein Amini, and Soren Svistrup. But I think that this was a case of too many cooks in the kitchen because Again, as I said before, the book might have had more of a straightforward approach to this serial killer, but the movie veers off in many different directions with characters in the end you don't really care about. There's a subplot involving one of the elected officials of Oslo, whose name is Arve Stop, who's played by J.K. Simmons, and his 
ambition to get a certain winter game at in Oslo. I, I don't know if it's the Olympics. I don't know if they mentioned it there, but it's it's some kind of world competition. And you you know that there's a shady side to J.K. Simmons' character, but one you ultimately find out has nothing to do with the plot at hand. There are also flashbacks to a suicidal maniac by the name of Rafto, who's played by Val Kilmer, who seems to be, I think in Val Kilmer's performance, almost in another movie. And also a side note about Val Kilmer, I don't know if it's drugs or too much plastic surgery, but Val Kilmer does not look like he did even 10 years ago. His days of being the good-looking A-lister are gone, and he, he almost seemed to be drunk during this movie, which I wasn't sure was the, the point of his character. I also didn't understand what exactly happened to his character, because first you see him die, and then or at least you think you do, because his, his body's covered in snow, and then you see him come back to life. I mean, you don't actually see him come back to life, but you see him in another flashback, and you're not sure if these two anecdotes in the story really connect. And there's also some inconsistency with many of the victims. There's one victim who's played by Chloe Sevigny in a very cool sequence where the detectives are actually called to Chloe Sevigny's character's house because Chloe Sevigny's character is reported missing, but obviously she's there, so she's not missing. But then, moments later, her character is killed, but then there's another character who's a cousin of Chloe Sevigny's who's actually played by Chloe Sevigny. So she plays two different characters, one of whom is killed. There's no irony or any sense of astonishment that Chloe Sevigny could, or Chloe Sevigny's character could look exactly like another person. And then once you find out that there's a close relative of Chloe Sevigny's character who's killed, who looks almost exactly like that person, that subplot is dropped entirely because... Honestly, in other detective films, if there's a twin, there's a conspiracy. But this movie didn't even seem to be clever enough to think about that conspiracy or that potential conspiracy. Instead, it just dropped it and kind of moved on to other murders and ultimately forgot its own rules in terms of who the serial killer is, why he kills, who he kills, and why. And it, the end was a decent twist, but honestly... Shoddy editing prevented this film from being anything worth remembering. And what's really unfortunate is that the Oslo, Norway location and the way the cinematographer filmed this movie made it at least a little bit memorable, but its editing resulted in this movie being a strikeout, a low strikeout. But I don't want to give it a flunk out because I do think Michael Fassbender, Chloe Sevigny, J.K. Simmons, Charlotte Gainsbourg, at least they did a good job and took their source material seriously. Unfortunately, it didn't really seem like the editor did, and also, the movie might have suffered from too many screenwriters in addition to that. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I'd like kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Freedom to soar with the hawks above Union Square. Boston, fourth place of revolution and complaint. Radio, miniaturized to fit in the pocket of your overalls. Together they spell bostonfreeradio.com. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, 
rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Goodbye, Christopher Robin. This is the latest, directed by Simon Curtis, who brought us such movies previously as My Week with Marilyn, starring Michelle Williams, and Woman in Gold, starring Helen Mirren and Ryan Reynolds, which I think is Ryan Reynolds' best performance to date, and yes, I am counting Deadpool. But Goodbye, Christopher Robin, very much like those other two movies, movies I mentioned, is based on a true story. It says in the beginning that it's inspired by a true story. So I'm not sure exactly what artistic liberty writers Frank Cottrell Boyce and Simon Vaughn took in adapting the true story of author A.A. A. Milne, excuse me, A.A. A. Milne, and his relationship with his son, Christopher Robin Milne, onto the big screen, but it is a very lovely and very fascinating movie, especially if you're a fan of Winnie the Pooh. I think you're going to really love Goodbye, Christopher Robin. It has a great cast behind it. A.A. A. Milne is played by Domhnall Gleeson. Uh, his wife, uh, A.A. A. Milne's wife, Daphne, is played by Margot Robbie, and there is a great performance here by of the title character, Christopher Robin, who in this movie is played by a very young actor who you can tell I'm, I'm trying to find his name. I can't find his name right now. I should have done that before, but uh, anyway. Okay. Oh, yes. Christopher Robin, aged eight, is played in this movie by Will Tilston. And I, I should have looked that up before I went on the air, but you have that little bit of dead air there for which I apologize. But Will Tilston has been in a couple of other TV shows before. I think this is, actually, this is his very first movie ever. And what I, what I'm afraid with Will Tilston is probably exactly the thing I'm afraid about the actor Jacob Tremblay, particularly when I saw him in Room two years ago. He is such a great child actor, but I do not want this kid to end up like Justin Bieber or Macaulay Culkin or any of the other child performer train wrecks. But he does a great job in this movie as the young Christopher Robin, who at first has a contentious relationship with his father because his father again, played by Domhnall Gleeson, is struggling with writer's block and also what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder, but back in the 20s, we knew it as shell shock. In other words, he was a World War I veteran who is still reeling from the, the after effects of being in the war, particularly on the front lines. So when his wife takes a leave of absence from their house and their maid, or rather nanny, Olive, who's played by Kelly McDonald, takes a, takes a sabbatical to care for her dying mother, this man is left with his son for whom he has little experience in relating to a child, particularly his own son. It's obvious that he has an affection for his son, but doesn't quite know exactly what to do with him. So they take walks on their sprawling estate in the woods, and using Christopher Robin's stuffed animal characters, they begin to gradually create the story of Winnie the Pooh. And they create all his friends, Eeyore, Tigger, Piglet, and if you know Winnie the Pooh, and pretty much who doesn't, you probably 
you, you know the characters, but it's really fascinating to see how the characters got their names. Why Winnie the Pooh was Winnie the Pooh and not Winnie the Bear. And also, why was his name Winnie when you think Winnie as Winifred? In other words, a woman's name. Well, that's all explained here. And how do the other characters in the story, like Kanga and Rue, fit into the story that A.A. A. Milne ultimately wrote? It's all explained in here. I think it's all explained really well. And Domino Gleason has been in a number of big movies, including some this year. And in fact, well, Domino Gleason was in a favorite of mine from a couple of years ago called Ex Machina, which came out three years ago. He was also in The Remnant. He played Bill Weasley in the Harry Potter movies. And he was also in the controversial movie Mother, uh, earlier this year. He's a good actor, and I think this is a breakthrough role for him because you haven't seen him play a father or even somebody who, as as far as I can remember, has struggled with what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder. But the relationship he has with eight-year-old Christopher Robin, again played by Will, Tins Will Tilston, is really adorable. And I, I absolutely loved seeing the story of Winnie the Pooh come into fruition. The movie does take a bit of a dramatic turn when the young Christopher Robin, who's known to his family as Billy Moon, but they named the boy Christopher Robin in the book, or the, the series of poems, obviously, when he begins to experience unasked for international celebrity. And when I was watching him go on these these press tours and having these elaborate parties where he was the guest of honor, I began to think to myself, this is an honor, but at the same time, getting this kind of treatment thrown on you when you're a little kid must be daunting. And the movie doesn't shy away from that fact at all. In fact, as I was, as I was watching it, I was thinking to myself, my God, this kid is so adorable. I don't want him to be corrupted by fame. Well, he's not... Well, I'm not going to tell you whether or not he's corrupted by fame, even though I might have spoiled that for you. But what I can tell you is Goodbye, Christopher Robin is a really great movie. Not only is it adorable in the, in the parts where you, you see Winnie the Pooh become the international phenomenon that it does become, but you also see a consequence, a negative consequence of such a story that was once shared between a father and son create an international following. And it's a, it's a following that's been solidified thanks to the Walt Disney Company. And this movie does present some very interesting facts about, about both A.A. A. Milne and Christopher Robin Milne. And I think it's worth seeing. There are parts that are tearjerkers. I'm not going to shy away from that, but it is a knockout. I, I don't know if it's actually based on a true story or inspired by a true story, but it is a fascinating movie and one of the best of the year so far. <laughs> hey everyone, let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see? Every moment can be kind of special. But they could be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments, it doesn't matter. Because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Love the real six They're the ones that move me. A thinly blown neurotic toe. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Earth Hacker Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio, watching on a community access TV station near you, or watching on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on 
Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So now that I've reviewed all the movies that I'm going to review for this show, I'm going to do an extended segment of what's coming out next. These are the movies that are coming out this coming weekend, some maybe a little bit sooner. But these are movies that are probably going to be in the top ten, and if they're not, I will most likely tell you, or at least if I think they're not going to be. So the big movie that's coming out this coming weekend, which is the weekend before Halloween, is Jigsaw, which is, I think, a prequel to the Saw movies. And I might see this. I'm I'm not entirely sure because, truth be told, as many movies as I've seen, I've actually never seen a single Saw movie. I only know them by reputation. I think probably the scene in Scary Movie 4 with Shaquille O'Neal and Dr. Phil acting out a Saw-like segment was probably the closest I've seen or I've been to seeing a Saw movie. But that said, I have a rule with sequels that I don't see a sequel unless I've seen the original first. I might break that rule with Jigsaw because I kind of get what Jigsaw or who Jigsaw is and what he does. But the plot of Jigsaw, which I might see, is as follows. Bodies are turning up around the city. What city? I don't know. Each having met a uniquely gruesome demise. As the investigation proceeds, evidence points to one suspect, John Kramer, the man known as Jigsaw, who has been dead for 10 years. So I know who Jigsaw is. I know the whole puppet thing with the bullseye on his cheeks. But I don't actually know whether it's a, a doll that's possessed like in Child's Play. I don't know that much about him, but... I will try to see Jigsaw. I won't make it a priority, but if I see that, I'll let you know about it next week. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is Suburbicon. This is directed by George Clooney and stars Matt Damon, Julianne Moore, and Oscar Isaac. This has a very simple description. It's as follows. A home invasion rattles a quiet family town. That's it. I don't know anything else about this movie. I don't watch movie previews, so I don't know what it's about, but I would be willing to check it out based probably solely on the fact that it has a stellar cast and an actor who has been very competent as a director. But other than that, I don't know anything about it. But I will see that movie, and I'll let you know what I think when I do my show next week. By the way, Suburbicon is George Clooney's seventh, uh, sixth movie that he's directed. He started out in 2002 with Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, which I thought was an excellent film. Good Night and Good Luck, he directed three years later, which was nominated for Best Picture, but didn't win. It actually lost to Crash. Leatherheads, which was a movie that I liked, but it didn't really get a lot of great reviews. The Ides of March is a movie that was hot for about a week or two, but then eventually faded away. I didn't see that one. The Monuments Men was a decent film. I remember that was one of the first movies I saw when I started doing my show in 2014. And then there's Suburbicon, which is a movie that's coming out this coming weekend. It got a lot of Oscar buzz. It has Academy Award nominees Matt Damon and Julianne Moore. Oscar Isaac has not been nominated for an Oscar, but that may change soon. But Suburbicon, as I said, it's a movie I will see, and I'll let you know what I think about it next week. Another movie that's coming out is called Thank You for Your Service, which is another one starring Miles Teller. Just for those of you who don't know or weren't tuned into the show earlier, Miles Teller was in the movie Only the Brave, so here he plays another veteran soldier. I mean, in Only the Brave, he played a firefighter, but certainly one that dealt with a lot of events that could have triggered post-traumatic stress disorder. But Thank You for Your Service is a movie that is about a group of U.S. soldiers returning from Iraq who struggle to integrate back into family and civilian life while living with the memory of a war that threatens to destroy them long after they've left the battlefield. So movies about Iraq or Afghanistan veterans have been hit or miss. Some have done extremely well, like American Sniper, which I mentioned earlier in the show. American Sniper did so well and made more money than all the other Best Picture nominees 
nominated that year combined. On the other hand, there have been other movies like Billy Lynn's Long Walk to Freedom, which came out last year and was directed by Ang Lee, that bombed. But the difference between American Sniper and Billy Lynn's Long Walk to Freedom is that American Sniper was really good, and that movie directed by Ang Lee was subpar. It just was not particularly focused storytelling-wise. But thank you for your service looks promising. In addition to Miles Teller, it also stars Haley Bennett, Keisha Castle-Hughes, and interestingly enough, Amy Schumer, who I wouldn't have expected to have done a dramatic role this early in her burgeoning stand-up comedy career, but I'm very interested to see if Amy Schumer plays an Iraq war veteran and or if she plays a civilian. But either way, I will see. Thank you for your service, and I'll let you know what I think next week. These other movies that are coming out are movies that are probably in limited release, including... All I See Is You. This is a movie that stars Blake Lively and Jason Clark, and it's a movie about a blind woman's relationship with her husband, which changes when she regains her sight and discovers disturbing details about themselves. This movie is listed as a drama, although judging from the somewhat postmodern design of the poster it looks like there might be a little bit of a supernatural element but of course that's what i'm assuming all i see is you is a movie that i've seen posters of in multiplexes to which i've attended and i can't exactly say whether or not it's going to be good i can't say whether any of these movies are going to be good but if this movie is playing in a theater near me i will certainly seek it out and i'll let you know what I think if I see it. It's directed, by the way, by Mark Foster, who's directed a number of films of note, per including, well, he's actually re recording a Christopher Robin film right now, or is filming right now. It's slated to come out next year. But he's also directed Finding Neverland and Stranger Than Fiction. Very interesting. Chris, you're not acting like a grown-up in our relationship. M2, M2. There's your comic book collection, the race car bed. I'm young at heart, but I put money into my 401k every paycheck. I'm taking control over my financial life, and that feels pretty grown up to me. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free ideas and easy ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. Are those footy pajamas? This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I have a cold. It's a very mild cold, but one that is definitely plugging up my sinuses. But I've managed to get through a vast majority of the show without losing my mind. So for that, I am grateful. But continuing on with my segment about the what's coming out next, these are, this is a spoken word preview of the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. There are a couple of films that are probably going to be released in limited release. One of them is Novitiate. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's spelled M-O-V-I-T-I-A-T-E. Uh, if, if somebody else has a different way of pronouncing that, I will take it. But in the meanwhile, I'll put my neck out there and probably make a fool out of myself by calling it Novitiate. This is a movie that's set in the early 1960s and during the era of Vatican II. It involves a young woman in training to become a nun who struggles with issues of fate, the changing church, and sexuality. That looks like a really interesting movie. I don't think there's been a, a movie about a priest or a nun or any other kind of religious person, or rather somebody who works in a high level in religion who has really questioned their faith 
like this, except perhaps maybe the movie, the underseen, underrated Silence from director Martin Scorsese starring Andrew Garfield. But that movie took place in the 1600s. This movie takes place in the early 1960s. So I'm very interested to see it, I, but I cannot guarantee if it's coming out in a theater near you or me. It is rated R. It's directed by Margaret Betts. And Margaret Betts is actually not... A, is a black woman who has directed uh, actually this is her feature debut she she also wrote the screenplay and her other credits have been directing a short called Engram and a documentary called The Carrier and she also was a bit role in the movie Any Given Sunday so I'm, I'm interested to see it based on the fact that it's directed by a woman, particularly a black woman, and yet there are no African-Americans in the main cast. I, I just find that interesting. And the movie stars Margaret Qualley and Julianne Nicholson. Julianne Nicholson is a youngish actress. Well, I, I think she'd be very flattered to know that I, I called her youngish. She's actually 46, but she's been in a number of movies of, of note recently, including Black Mass, starring Johnny Depp, which is grossly underrated, by the way. She was also in August, Osage County, which received a number of award nominations, but I still actually have not seen that movie. But you could probably not blame me too much because August, Osage County came out in 2013. I started hosting the show in 2014. And she's going to be in a movie later called I, Tanya, which is a movie about Tanya Harding, which is coming out soon. It stars Margot Robbie as Tanya Harding. And she doesn't play Nancy Kerrigan. She plays Diane Rawlinson. And I wish I could tell you who that was in the in the in the scope of the whole Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding scandal, but I can't because I don't have that information. But Novitiate, if that movie is coming out in a theater near me, I will make it a point to see it and I will let you know what I think when I host my show next week. And the last movie that's coming out is one called The Square. It is a poignant satirical drama reflecting our times, according to the description, about the sense of community, moral courage, and the affluent person's need for egocentricity in an increasing uncer in increasingly uncertain world. And this is a movie that is a foreign film. It's directed by Ruben Ostland, who is a Swedish director. And the movie doesn't star anybody who... Oh, actually, it does. It, it stars Elizabeth Moth, M Moss, excuse me, best known for playing Peggy Olsen on Mad Men, and she's also in the Amazon series The Handmaiden's Tale. It also co-stars Dominic West, who's primarily best known for being in The Wire, amongst other movies and TV shows. That one, just based on its premise sounds extremely interesting to me and it has some american and british actors in it not that that would ever not that foreign actors would ever prevent me from seeing a movie or prevent my desire from seeing the movie but again the square is another movie it may not be coming out this week in a theater near me or you but it sounds pretty damn interesting even amongst its vague storyline but if I see it, I'll let you know what I think next week. And that just about wraps things up for Words on Film for today, October 24th, October 24th 2017. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I successfully battled the minor cold that might have prevented me from doing this show. I just want to remind all of you that are listening that the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working for the station which is airing the show or the station as a whole. With that said, I just want to let thank you for listening, and I'm Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.